Hi, I'm Lance Humphreys. I'm the Executive Director of the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy. Welcome to Flower Mart. We'd like to thank the Baltimore City Master Gardeners for putting together a panel to discuss pollinators and what you can do with container gardening to support them. Enjoy. Thank you, Lance. I'm Michael Andorski. I'm a Master Gardener in Baltimore City, and we're going to talk all about pollinators and why they're important for our gardens. So to begin with, before talking about pollinators, we need to know what they pollinate. So there are four plant types, as you know. This is the mosses, and then we have the ferns, and then we have the evergreens, and then we have the flowering plants. And the flowering plants are sometimes look like this, like flowers. And I can't advance this, I don't know why. Great. With petals and anthers and pistils, the center of the flower. But these flowering plants can also look other ways as well. So this, for example, is a maple tree, which is a flowering plant. All the little buds on the maple tree are really flowers. And this is a shrub and all of the white you see are also flowers. And here's a weed, a dandelion, which is also a flowering plant. This is the flower of the dandelion. And here's a cucumber. So many vegetables have flowers as well. And here's the cucumber's vegetable, the cucumber's flower. And this is a blueberry. Blueberries are flowers. Flowering plants make up over 80% of all of the kinds of plants we have. And those plants need pollination. It brings us to we have to understand how a flower works, know how it pollinates. So here we have a diagram of a flower. This is the pistil, the female part of the flower in the middle. And over here is the anther. The anther is where the pollen is kept. And here's a picture of a dime. And over to the right of the dime, all of this little powdery stuff, that's the pollen, which is in the anther. Right there. So. The anther has to deliver the pollen somehow back to the pistil and the ovule where the female uh, entity is kept in order to form seeds. But plants don't like their own pollen. They want to be cross-pollinated, meaning they want to get the pollen from one flower into another flower. So how do we do that? How does it get over there? And then get, how does it get down into the pistil? all the way down to the ovules where it combines the pollen plus everything in the circle are little ovules all these little dots contain thousands of ovules the pollen can mixes with the ovule and what do you get you get a seed and the seed ends up growing in this very neat way which i will speed up for you first the root then the stem, and so on and so forth. And none of that would have happened without cross-pollination. Okay, so how do you get cross-pollination? There are several ways of doing it. The wind can do it. So here's an example of the wind blowing pollen. Here's the pollen. The wind is blowing it off of one flower to the other. Some plants have water pollination, such as this water lily. So the water carries the pollen from one flower to the next flower. But the kind of pollination we're interested in and the one that is the most common is animal po pollination. So which animals pollinate? Many animals pollinate, the flies pollinate, the wasps pollinate, the ants pollinate, the beetles pollinate, even bats can pollinate, although not in Maryland. All can carry pollen from one flower to the next. Butterflies, which we all love in our gardens, of course, we all know as pollinators, as are hummingbirds. All of these move pollen from one flower to the other. So here's an example of some beautiful butterflies you will see in your garden. There are hundreds of different butterflies in Maryland. The black swallowtail, the monarch, the orange sulfur, and the skipper are very, very common. All of these are pollinators. 
As for hummingbirds, we have in Maryland about six different kinds of hummingbirds. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird, and this little fellow over here is a rufous hummingbird, two out of the 20. But who cross-pollinates the most? Well, it's the bee, and it's usually the female bee. And the bee is the only animal that actually needs the pollen for herself. So the pollen isn't just cross-pollinated by accident. She wants some of that pollen to take for herself, to take back to her nest, as well as giving it over to the pistil of the other plant. Here's one kind of bee, uh, which everybody knows about, the honeybee, Apis. Here's a leaf cutter bee, so named because it loves to cut into the leaves to form its nest. And this beautiful bee is called an osmia, mason bee that you see in the spring. And here is a bumblebee. Uh, uh, these are four of only the 400 bees we have in Maryland. Now, once upon a time, this is what the forest looked like. There were no bees, there were no butterflies, there were no birds. There were plenty of dinosaurs and there were plenty of green plants that sort of looked like ferns like this. Um, but there were no flowers. And then the first flower came along. And we know it's a flower because it was preserved in stone. This is called Archaeofructus. The importance of that is that 130 million years ago when the first flower came along, not long after the first bee came along. And that first bee we know about because it was preserved in, in amber. The importance of both of these coming about at the same time means there was co-evolution. Both of these developed and both of these developed in ways that supported the other. The bee did things that the flowers liked and the flowers did things that the bee liked and the relationship between the two is absolutely amazing. So the flowers could think, they had to think, how can I get bees to cross pollinate me? Uh, so the first attempt was, I'm gonna draw, develop beautiful petals. So this is called Archaeofructus. And this is a picture of the plant that I just showed you on a piece of stone. It's under, an underwater plant as you see by the fish. And these are the petals. That's the first attempt at petals. Not very pretty, but that's the first attempt. A little while later, Amborella came by. This flower still exists in parts of the world today. And again, these are the petals, but the bee still didn't, the flower still didn't have exactly what it needed to attract the bee, which was a landing place for the bee and other pollinators and a target so the bee knows where to go to get the pollen. So here's an example of a nice flat landing place with a target in the middle. Here's another example, this lily with a flat landing place and a target in the middle. And here's another example of, of an asymmetrical flower, an orchid, but again, it has a target right smack dab in the middle and a flat landing place for the bee. Uh, not all flowers were flat like that. Some of them were tubes and they attracted these very long tongued bees to get into the flower. But most of them were flat and most of them had targets. So about 95 million years ago, this flower comes along, this beautiful magnolia. But bees didn't like it, beetles liked it. And the bees didn't like it because the flower was still missing something the bees wanted, which was nectar. So they had to develop nectar. And here it is a flower showing nectar. Most nectar is clear, but this flower has red nectar. And as you see, most of this red nectar is around the base of the flower, a little bit drips out, but most of it's right here around the base where the pistil is. So the bee or another pollinator has to brush by and drop off the pollen as it goes after the nectar to drink. In addition, the flowers, if they could think, thought, well, you know, bees aren't too intelligent. I need to give them some signposts. And they developed these nectar guides, these long little lines that showed the bee where they wanted it to go, which was smack dab right in the middle where the pistol was and where the anthers were, where the pollen was and where the nectar was as well. Here's another example of nectar guides. Here's another example of nectar guides. All these long lines indicate to the bee and other pollinator where to go. So that's what the flower did. 
but the bee had to do something in order to get to the flower. And it developed a wonderful sense of vision, wonderful sense of navigation, and was able to, at least for some bees, such as bumblebees and honeybees, communicate with other bees to tell them where the nectar and where the flowers were. So how does a bee do this? So this is a bee's eyes, these two big ones on the outside of the eyes for vision, and these three little ones in here are used for navigation. Now, bees see differently than we see. So this is an evening primrose, and this is how we see it. It's all yellow, but a bee that has ultraviolet vision sees it differently, and it looks like this under ultraviolet vision. So you notice that what we don't see, the bee sees, which is a target here in the middle, in nectar guides, all the way around. So flowers were designed for bees and pollinators to get to, not for us to realize how beautiful they are. Then the bee sees polarized light. What's polarized light? Well, here we all see polarized light as a rainbow. Polarized light is light that is broken apart by uh, small elements in the air, in this case, water droplets, which separate the light into a spectrum. And so we see a, a rainbow as polarized light in a cloudy day. But a bee sees this polarized light as purple all day long, every day. And that polarized arc plus the location of the sun tells the bee exactly where he or she is and where he or she has to go to get to its nectar. So a bee can detect the flowers by scent. A bee's scent is 200 times better than your scent or my scent. And a bee's scent is detected by its antennae, its mouth, and its legs. It doesn't have a nose, but it has little, little sensilia, excuse me, these little hairs all over it, which detect scent in those three areas. Then the bee has to communicate to its other bees to let them know where the nectar is. So it does a waggle dance. And it waggles in the direction of where the nectar is. And the longer it waggles, the further away the nectar is. The shorter it waggles, the closer it is. So that's what the nectar dance looks like, the waggle dance looks like. And this is a real beehive with real wagglers. Let's see if we can get it on here. Here we go. So here's a bee waggling, and you notice where all these other bees are? They're all of the bees behind there, right? Because not only are they following the bee to figure out which direction to go, they're also smelling the bees filled with nectar so they can smell the nectar that they need to get. And that's how honeybees and bumblebees communicate with each other to let them know where there's a source of nectar in the flowers. So what does the bee want out of this relationship with the flowers? Well, what the bee wants is food. And the bee has to, the bee, the food for the bee is the nectar and the pollen. And so how does it get to the nectar? Well, for one thing, it has a very long tongue. And this tongue is very specialized. The tongue is very hairy at the end and it soaks up the nectar. And once it gets inside this maxilla, these two bony parts, these bony parts close down and form a tube and it sucks it up just the way we would suck in a straw. So there are two kinds of bees, short tongue and long tongue. If you were a short tongue bee, your tongue would go from your mouth to your belly button. And if you were a long tongue bee, your tongue would go from your mouth all the way down to your toes. Okay, what about the pollen? Is there anything special about the pollen that the flower has done to make it easier for the bee to carry it? And is there anything the bee that has done to make it easier for her to carry it? So again, here's a picture of the pollen. It's like a little bit of dust, but if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like this. There's little points on it, and those little points stick to the body of the bee. In addition, the pollen tends to be gooey, and that gooeyness helps it stick to the bee. Some plants, such as milkweed, have a different plant. So this is a penny with Abraham Lincoln's nose on it to give you an idea of the size of the plenia. The plenia in milkweed plants 
have thousands and thousands of grains of pollen on each side and a little barb at the end, which holds onto the bee. And that's how the bee transports the pollen. So that's what the flower does to make it easier for the bee. But what does the bee do to get the pollen? Well, one thing the bee can do is this thing called buzz pollination. So here's a bee and it's flapping its wings very rapidly. And all of these little spots are pollen moving through the air. And the harder it flaps its wings, the more cloud of pollen it gets around it. And that's how it gets its pollen. In addition, the pollen can be held onto the bee by all of these little hairs that the bee has in specialized scopa, specialized areas and the legs that are very hairy that hold onto pollen. All of this is pollen that the bee's holding onto. That's called a curbicula, pollen-filled curbicula. Here's another picture of it without the pollen on it, but it's a very hairy area that is loaded with pollen. That bee can carry twice its weight in pollen when it's all filled up. And the bee's hair isn't just straight, it's very tangly. This is bee's hair under a microscope. This is pollen under a microscope. So this very tangled hair helps hold on to the pollen as well. So that's how a bee holds on to the pollen, carrying half her weight in pollen over her head, where it's very hairy, over her legs, in the scope, as I showed you before. And here she is at work, going from flower to flower. She'll visit about 50 flowers in one hour. She gets to the pistol, and she drops off the pollen. She goes to the next flower. She gets the pollen from the anthers and drops some more off again, and so on and so forth. And she keeps going and going and going, one flower after the other. Okay, so pollinators are important. Bees are important. Butterflies are important, as are all the other pollinators. And pollinators account for 70% of all the crops that we eat. Certain crops, such as corn, don't need pollinators. They have wind pollination. But 70% of everything we eat requires pollination by an animal. As a matter of fact, for most people's diets, one out of three bites of the food we eat is animal pollinated. And if we were going to pollinate the plants ourselves, we would have to spend, it's estimated, $200 billion a year to drop pollen off onto planes, either using drones or airplanes. And in fact, right now, California almond growers who supply most of almonds to the world spend over $300 million a year importing bees from largely Australia and parts of America for six weeks just to pollinate their plants. Over $300 million for six weeks because without them, the plants, the almond trees would not be pollinated. Now, the bees are having a problem now. And you've, lots of you have seen the Save the Bees signs all over. And there's six major concerns regarding the bees. There's other concerns regarding butterflies. We're going to stick to the bees today since they're the major pollinator. The first is um, global warming. So this is a little bit of more global warming than we, we hoped ever to see. But the global warming gets the bees out of sync with the flowers. And so the flowers will bloom when the bees have not come out of their nest yet or vice versa. And that will cause, cause a problem in getting the bees ready to pollinate the flowers when they need to be pollinated. The second is insecticides. Well, here's one solution. We could put little masks on all the bees, but that's not very practical. And insecticides, if they're not used correctly, are a real problem. So a couple of years ago in Florida, they sprayed insecticides to get rid of a mosquito virus and they sprayed it during the day rather than at night by mistake. And they killed millions of bees doing this. Uh, these are, there's several viruses and mites that cause damage to bees and beehives. This is a Varroa mite, which gets onto the little bee pupa, this white thing. Here's the Varroa mite and it sucks out all of the insides of the growing uh, pupa. Then there are invasive species. So this is uh, 
an example of two of the invasive species that inhabit the garden and they prevent the flowers growing that the bees need to get to. This is called lesser celandine, and this is Japanese stilt grass, which I'm sure many of you have seen in your own gardens. But the most important thing is habitat fragmentation. So back in 1800, if you look at the rural area, almost the entire country was rural. If you look here at 1850, about 80% of the country was rural and 20% was urban. But looking ahead to 2000, we find it's exactly reversed. Only 20% is rural and the rest, all this purple area, 80% is urban. And with urban areas come more streets, more driveways, more parking lots, and less flowers for the bees to get to. Uh, so our habitation is important to keep up. And uh, you'll get a lecture in a minute about how even if you have container gardens, you can help the bees out. To have a brief bee a bee friendly habitat in any size yard, it's very possible. Here's a beautiful planted garden, and you should have a garden that has 75% natives, 25% non natives. Why 75% natives? Well, many of the bees and many of the butterflies will only go to specific native plants. And the non native plants, which have been made to look beautiful for us, often are deprived of the nectar that is needed by the bees. So make your garden 75% natives. Do not use double petals. So here is an example of, of things that bees and butterflies can't get to because they can't get to the anthers of the flowers to get to the pollen and they can't get to the pistils because they're all closed. Dahlias, impatience, and rose. But you can buy dahlias, impatience, and roses that are fine to use. Here's a nice open dahlia with a pistil in the middle. Likewise, an impatient with a pistil in the middle, and here's a nice open rose with the anthers and the pistil in the middle. So you want open flowers. You want, a, you want an area that has large drifts of flowers, the same flower going for a period of time, and you want to avoid using mulch if you can, because the bees uh, often live in the ground and they can't get under the ground if there's mulch there. They can get there if there's green, low uh, uh, low shrubbery and low green cover, but not mulch. Also make sure there's a water source for the pollinators. Now, a lot of us have lawns. This is what the English have taught us to do, but there are different kinds of lawns. This lawn is fine to have. Why is this lawn okay? It's okay because it's loaded with clover and the clover is something the bees can get to. So if you have a lawn, make sure there's clover in it and make sure you don't use insecticides on it. And you can have a beautiful lawn that looks just like this. So if you do these things, you can be responsible for making sure that the forests no longer look the way they used to, but the forests look like this in the springtime now, and your backyard looks like this. And if you're doing these things, not only is it beautiful for you, but is beautiful for all the pollinators as well. If you need more help with this, or you have a community garden and you want the pollen committee of the Baltimore City Master Gardeners to help you out with design of the garden, with showing which flowers need to go in the garden, with helping you purchase the flowers, with actually getting down in the dirt with you and planting those flowers, just give us a call, give us an email at Baltimore City dot pollinators at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Okay, that's the end of the show. Are we beginning? Yeah, Kathleen, you can go ahead and get started. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm Kathleen Green, and along with Joe McClintock, we are co-chairs of the Grow It, Eat It initiative. It's part of the University of Maryland Extension. 
We're volunteers and we work to encourage Marylanders to grow their own food. Today we're going to be talking about growing your own food in a container garden and also encouraging pollinators. Okay, what's the connection between edible gardens and pollinators? Anybody know what that, that is, that picture is? You can see the pollinators, but what is that yellow thing? That's a squash blossom. Fruiting plants, tomatoes, beans, squash, they all need pollination to set fruit. And by having uh, pollinating uh, plants that are friendly to pollinators, you keep them in your garden and they can get busy when, when your vegetables need pollination. How about this beautiful flower? This is from our community garden. I don't know if any of you recognize it, but it is a vegetable plant. Uh, and it has a pollinator with it. You can see the little bee. Okay, so edible gardens are enhanced by growing flowering plants to attract pollinators. What we have here is a zinnia, and you can see it's pretty open, and they are working on that. Those little yellow, actual yellow stuff here is what they're working on. So we have a swallowtail butterfly and a bee. So, uh, and then here's a close up. Again, this is from our community garden, and you can see that this little guy is just covered with pollen. Uh, zinnias also are edible, as are nasturtiums, marigolds, and pansies. So you can grow them for the pollinators, and you can also put some on your salad. Other plants that are helpful in your garden would be parsley and dill, for example, because those are edible for caterpillars. People like them too. So if you want to start a container garden, there's things you need to consider. First of all, what do you want to grow? That will affect the type of container you need and the depth of the size of it. Uh, you'll need to use a growing media, not, not just garden soil. You want a soilless mix or compost or a, composite or a combination of both of them. And then you also have to think about where you're going to put your pot. Um, if it's a small pot, you can move it around to catch the sun as you need. But you need to have sun and you need to have access to water. Most vegetables can be grown in containers, um, and, but you just have to match the container size to the plant's needs. So you can see these tomatoes, cabbage, beans, they can all be grown. They can all be grown in, in pots. The rule of thumb is one to two below to above. So if you look at, if you look at a plant like this, can you see it? Okay, so this is what's above and this is what's below. It's not full grown yet. So you have to think about when it's full grown. But what's below can be about half of what's above. So if you have a tomato, you need a big pot. Okay, so here you are. Okay, so, so here's some example of plants being grown in containers. Um, down here you see there's a salad table and lettuce is being grown. And this is very nice for people who may have trouble bending over, and it doesn't have to be very deep. Here's a, a, a garden that's set out. I'm afraid, I'm afraid there's a lot of mulch there. Uh, but you can see all different sizes. Here's some raised beds, which is sort of a type of container. It's not closed on the bottom. And then there's all, all these other different pots and things growing on them. Uh, these, you can have it on a deck or a porch, as long as it's getting sufficient sunlight for, it, for its needs. Okay, so. Let's look at, so as I said, you have to think about the depth. So if you have a shallow pot that is four to six inches in depth, then these are the things that you can grow. So you can, you can grow lots of greens, you can grow lettuce. Here's a nice crop of spinach. And up here you can see there's strawberries. So there's many things that you can grow. Cilantro is a great one. Okay, so, but this is with the shallow depth. So they don't have deep roots. Now, if you have medium roots, these are things that you can grow. So you can grow carrots in a pot. You can grow peppers, squash, rosemary, a lot of the, you can grow a tomato, but it has to be a dwarf one. So again, if you only have a small pot, you need to go for the dwarf things for tomatoes and cucumbers. But there's lots that you can grow. And you see here, we've got a mixture. We've got flowers, pollinators. We've got cabbage. And we've got lettuce. So th this is the one to three gallon container size. Now, 
when you have full-size tomatoes and other things like that, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, peas, squash, these things need deeper. They need deeper pots. Okay, and so a four to five gallon container will work. Now, if you look at this right here, this, this wooden barrel, this is a half whiskey barrel. And that, you can grow about, about anything in there. It's about 20, 20 gallons. And again, you see they've got some marigolds in with it. Yeah, and tomato there. Um, we've grown sweet potatoes in them, and it's worked very well. Okay, so when we're thinking about planting, so we're going to start planting one. First thing you need is you have to have drainage. So you need a drainage tray under it to keep keep things moist. And uh, But you don't want your soil falling out of the holes. So you need to use something like a, a coffee filter or a paper towel, or you can use mesh, something to keep the soil inside, but that the water will come through. Okay, so if you're going to start a cart container plant and you need to dampen your media. So we're talking again, compost, we're com talking compost or soilless media. So you add the water, mix it up before you start. Okay, then you have your pot and you're going to put some soil in the bottom of it. And then you can see I've taken three plants out of their pots and I've laid it on onto the soil below. I'm calling it soil. Of course, it's a soilless mix. And then next, you know, now also notice I could put a lot more plants in here, but I don't want to because I want to have room for the roots to grow. If I make it too crowded, it's not going to be healthy for the plants. Okay, then you can fill up the media up to about an inch below the top of your container. And okay, so here we have cabbage and we have nasturtiums. And that nasturtium, that nasturtium label like this on the back will give you instructions about what the needs of the plant are. Also, you want to think about the needs of the plant. If they all need the same water level, if they all need the same amount of sunlight. And then after you've put them in there, don't press them in. Just use water. Water them at the end to help the roots find their right place in the soil. And there you are. In the, the plants are in their new home. So again, when you're watering, you have to think, you want to water things gently. You want to water the soil, not the leaves, okay? So, and you, for containers, because, because they're limited in size, you have to be careful. You have to be careful to water them uh, such that the excess drains off, they don't get overwatered, but they don't get underwatered as well. And in the summer, you may have to water daily. On a rainy day, maybe not, but you do have to have a system. If you have a lot of them, you may want to set up a drip system to help you um, keep them all watered and happy. And if you're going away for the week, make sure you get somebody to water them while you're gone. Okay, so just have some. so this is the picture we started with in the beginning. Anybody know what that is? That's an okra. That's an okra plant. And you can see there's more buds here. Yeah, that's okra. And here again, this is our community garden. You can see we have a sunflower. And back here, do you see these red flowers on the beans? Those are actually those are red runner beans. So those are bean plants. And believe me, those red flowers attract all kinds of pollinators, including hummingbirds. And this is a pot of garlic chives. And you can see the bees love them. And you can also eat the flowers. They make very nice, uh, they make very nice fritters. Put a little egg and flour and some of these, and you'll get a wonderful fritter. Okay, so in terms of thinking about maximizing your harvest, you can start your vegetable plants indoors. You'll need to have a source of light for them besides just the win window, window light. Um, and then after you've got them, you can move containers to maximize the sunlight 
or provide shade. So if you think about lettuce, lettuce is great in the spring, but when you get to the summer, it can be too hot. So you might want to move them onto your porch, for example. The other thing to think about is succession planting. So you might pot, have a pot with lettuce in it in, in the spring and then move on to a pepper, for example, in the, in the summer and then move back to lettuce again in the fall. You do want to fertilize after each crop. Again, there's limitations to how much nutrients you have and as the crop uses it and water takes some of it away, you need to fertilize. And then at the end, you can bring your plant indoors. My daughter had a, a pepper plant in a pot and then she brought it indoors in the fall and kept it. And now she's got it back outside. So anyway, let's start growing and thank you very much.